Hey everyone, welcome back to Karn Academy. My name is Karn and I hope you're all doing super well. Today we'll be talking about an approach to GI bleeding. Now this is going to be a bit different to the lectures we've done previously. Instead of talking about one condition and then how we diagnose it and treat it, I'm going to be talking about a presentation and then talking about, a bit about how we come to a diagnosis or a differential diagnosis list, how we manage these conditions and so on. So starting off nice and easy, in terms of differentials, broadly, you need to divide. Whenever you see GI bleed, you need to think, is this an upper GI bleed or is this a lower GI bleed? The two present quite differently, and we'll go through their presentations in a bit. But broadly speaking, you can have upper GI bleeds. The way, the way I like to think about it, I usually divide it by kind of organ. So with the stomach, we have peptic ulcer disease and erosive gastritis. You can then have vascular causes like esophageal varices and angiodysplasia tumors like esophageal cancer, and then other things like portal hypertension. Upper GI bleeds, and then we have lower GI bleeds. But lower GI bleeds, typically things like diverticulosis, um, inflammatory bowel disease, so your uh, UC and Crohn's, and then in invasive or inflammatory diarrhea. And we talked a bit about dysentery in our lecture on gastroenteritis. In terms of vascular causes, angiodysplasia, hemorrhoids, ischemia, AV malformations. Now, if you see, we have angiodysplasia as both an upper GI bleed cause and lower GI bleed cause. And this is one of those cheeky buggers that's really hard to pick up. And it's just annoying when it comes to clinical management. And we go through this in a bit. But again, what I'm trying to emphasize is that it can present quite differently. One of the biggest differentials for any lower GI bleed is going to be colorectal cancer. And that's a huge, huge one. And then we have anal fissures. And as they tear... You can have bleeding, but that's that tends to be very different to the bleeding of things like IBD or colorectal cancer. With anal fissures, you also have bleeding that's typically described as blood on the toilet paper and not blood mixed in stools or hematochesia. So what are some features of GI bleeding? So firstly, you can vomit up blood. And when you vomit up blood, you always think upper GI causes, right? That can be either red or coffee ground. What is the difference between red and coffee ground vomit? If it's red, it means that it's very fresh. It hasn't, it hasn't been digested. It hasn't undergone any change. It's just come out as is. Now, that can mean two things. Um, sorry, before I tell you what red vomit means, let's talk about coffee ground. Why do you get coffee ground vomit? With peptic ulcers that are often slow bleeding, you can have bleeding into the lumen of the stomach. And with gastric, gastric secretions, you start digesting the blood. And by the time it reaches to levels that induces emesis or hematemesis, it is often coffee ground in color. So it's not frank blood. When you see red blood, you need to think a few things. A, the bleeding is high enough that it hasn't actually reached the stomach. So esophageal pathology or the bleeding is so quick that it just is not being digested at all. And red often is a bit more concerning. With melina, melina is basically the same type of bleeding pattern, but now coming out the other end. So just like with coffee ground vomit that underwent a bit of digestion, you now have a lot more digestion. Um, and obviously it's going to pass out, pass out the other end. And this presents with tarry black stools and they have a really really bad odor if you see melina you will not forget melina it smells horrible and the entire ward knows that there is melina and as you can imagine this is going to be an upper gi bleed because for it to be black tarry and digested it has to pass through most of the gi tract and therefore if you're bleeding close to the rectum it's not going to be melina and then you have hematochesia which is the passage of bright red or fresh blood through the anus this can be either with stool or without stool. And at this point, we worry about lower, lower GI bleeds, particularly bleeds in the digital colon. You can then also have hematochesia with upper GI bleeds. Now, why do you get this? Again, if the bleeding is so quick that it's just flowing through rapidly and not being digested, that can present with hematochesia. And one of the big causes for that would be a bleeding peptic ulcer. And here's just a graphic representation of what that might look like. Um, so depending on where the bleeding is, um, heavy bleeding tends to be more red in color because it hasn't had time to undergo digestion, while light bleeding tends to be coffee ground in color. In terms of 
what you see in your stool. Um, it's mostly going to be frank red blood. Um, and that's going to be because it's a very quick passage with heavy bleed versus light bleeding that is typically malina right up to the diurnal part and then can present with things like hematochesia. Um, and all of these would have a positive um, fecal occult blood test because, well, all that the fecal occult blood test is if there is if there is anything that's causing a bleed. So if there's any trace of blood. So let's go through some cases, because I think the only way to really understand this is by going through some cases. Before that, a, su a few things I always want to clear up. Um, you need to understand the difference in how upper and lower GI bleeds present, which we briefly talked about. You need to evaluate the chronicity of bleeds, the complications like anemias and hemodynamic compromise. And then is there any other pathology that the bleeding could be because of? So do they have liver cirrhosis that's caused uh, varices, esophageal varices that are now bleeding? Do they have peptic ulcer disease that's caused the bleeding peptic ulcer? Do they have um, colorectal cancer that's caused the bleeding? Always assess what's actually going on. So let's go through a case. David is a 54-year-old plumber with osteoarthritis of his fingers, for which he takes Voltaren. Uh, Voltaren is an NSAID. For the past three weeks, he's had intermittent upper abdominal pain, which he notices is better after eating and improved with antacids. Three days ago, while at work, he noticed his stools were loose and dark. While he thought this was unusual, his work was busy and he could not take time off to see the doctor. Two days later, when he got up at night to go to the toilet, he felt light and dizzy, passed a large amount of dark blood per rectum, Wife called the ambulance, took him to the ED. No other relevant medical history. His father had peptic ulcer disease. He's a smoker of 20 cigarettes a day um, and social quantities of alcohol. On clinical examination, he appears pale, unwell, with, and he's high, uh, tachycardic. His rest rep is 18 and blood pressure of 100 over 60, which is borderline hypo. And he has a 20 millimeter mercury postural drop on sitting. There's no sign of chronic liver disease. Abdomen was lax and non-tender. Liver spleen were normal in size. Rectal examination revealed burgundy colored stool. So in this street, let's talk about what's important. He has osteoarthritis for which he takes Voltaren. Why is Voltaren important? Voltaren is an NSAID and NSAIDs put you at a high risk of peptic ulcer disease. And he's been, and considering that osteoarthritis is a chronic complication, it is, likely that he's been taking Voltaren for a long time. Next, we have the fact that he has this intermittent upper abdominal pain that he notices is better off eating and is improved with antacids. Now, what does that indicate? Well, the fact that he has intermittent upper abdominal pain makes us think peptic ulcer disease. And the fact that it's better after eating and improved with antacid makes me think a gastric ulcer compared to a duodenal ulcer. As you know, and we covered earlier, the duodenal ulcers tend to be worse off with food um, and better in the interim periods. He also notices that his stools were dark. Now, this is important because this indicates that he might, he might have had or he might have been having a bit of melina going on. And he obviously didn't take note of this. What does this indicate? Well, the fact that this was two days ago and he had dark colored stools makes me think, well, this man has been bleeding through this peptic ulcer, if this is a peptic ulcer, for at least two days. That's a lot of blood, right? Two days later, when he got up tonight, he felt, he felt light and dizzy. Why does he feel light and dizzy? Well, because he's lost a lot of blood. And then he also passes large amounts of blood per rectum. His wife called an ambulance and father had a family history of peptic ulcer disease, which is relevant as well. Now, how does his examination fit in? Well, he appears pale and unwell, indicating that he's lost blood and has hemodynamic compromise. He has a pulse of 110. And as you know, um, being tachycardic is one of the first signs of hypotension of hemodynamic compromise. His pulse is regular, which means he's not an AF, but it's still tachycardic. His respirate is normal um, and has, but he has borderline hypertension. What other things are important? He has a partial drop of 20 mm. Why is that relevant? That is relevant because he has orthostatic hypotension, which means that he's intravascularly fluid, uh, he's intravascularly fluid depleted. No signs of chronic liver disease, means, which means it's unlikely to be a variceal bleed. Um, and erectile examination reveals burgundy colored stools. 
Okay, what does all of that tell us? All of that tells us that this man is not having a good time at all. He has had a few days long of history. He has had a history of a few days, which is not good. He has had quite a severe presentation to the ED and is hemodynamically unstable. All of those factors are not good. In terms of his blood work, um, what do we not? So take a moment and try to interpret his FBE. So he has a hemoglobin of 115, which is a bit low for a male. His white cells are normal and the blood film reveals a reticulocytosis or high levels of reticulocytes. High levels of reticulocytes could mean a few things. Well, high levels of reticulocytes basically mean that his, his bone marrow has gone into overdrive trying to make more cells. And well, you need more cells because either, so you're losing cells for some reason. This can either be because of something like a hemolytic anemia or because of blood loss. In terms of his UECs, he has a high urea, but a normal creatinine. How, how does that happen? Does he have kidney disease? But the reason for that is with a high urea, you think, oh, could this be a kidney pathology? It's actually not. When you have such levels, such high levels of bleeding through the GI tract, a lot of that blood is going to be absorbed, right? It's going to be digested and absorbed just like any other food would. And part of that, and one of the breakdown products is urea. And so you have a high level of urea because you're digesting this blood, but your creatinine is going to be normal because you have normal kidney function. It's not a kidney issue. And LFTs, coag, and chest x-ray normal. Why, why did we do a chest x-ray in this case? Well, one of the things is, that we really worry about is a perforation or perforated peptic ulcer. And that can often present with a pneumoperitoneum, which would be air under the diaphragm. Okay, moving on. So how would you group your questions? So obviously this history presented everything, but a good summary of what you should ask. Always start with our WWQQA. Next, ask about quantity. And it's normal, like in an exam, you are expected to know, uh, and you're, because you have simulated patients, they would know what to answer. Ask about color. Uh, and what a, what a consultant once told me is that if you aren't being just creepy in, the, in your line of questioning, you're not doing a good enough job. What else? Now, the next question is going to be, is this an upper GI bleed or a lower GI bleed? How do we ask that? So ask about melina versus hematochesia. Ask about whether they have hematemesis. Ask if they have epigastric pain. If you suspect a liver issue and always suspect a liver issue, ask yourself, is this acute? Is this chronic? Is the liver cirrhotic? And if so, how long has this been going on for? The liver does quite a bit of other stuff too. It makes coags, it makes albumin, and makes platelets. What I'd like to emphasize here is that liver function tests, so your AST, ALT, GGT, ALP, they're good for acute inflammation, but because these are enzymes and you get higher levels when they leak out of cells, with chronic long-term damage, you can often see normal LFTs in a cirrhotic patient. So a quick complication screen for whatever they're presenting with, anemia, as you can see, this patient would have lost blood because they have an upper GI bleed. To ask about um, things like weight loss, fatigue, pale. Have they felt dizzy, faint, and orthostatic hypertension, which you can measure? Are they cold or clammy? And shortness of breath palpitations are more um, kind of severe complications of that. What medications do they take? Um, and what effects these medications could have? As we noted, the fact that this person is taking Voltaren is a huge, huge, huge um, it's a huge, huge, huge concern for us and is one of the first things that led us down the peptic ulcer tract. Next, ask yourself, could this have a hepatic component? With upper GI bleeds, one of the worst things that you could have is a variceal bleed. And therefore, always ask if they, A, are a big drinker, B, have had hepatitis, or C, just ask yourself, do you, or just ask them very frankly, do you have liver disease or have you ever been told that you have liver disease? And then could this be a cancer? So how do you manage an upper GI bleed? Step one, <laughs> assess. Again, this seems relatively straightforward. 
Um, but then when it comes to clinical examinations in your OSCEs, you still need to go through all of this. So AIMS 65 is a really, really good tool that I found um, that's good for assessing the severity of upper GI bleed. So this is especially useful if you suspect the upper GI bleed being a variceal bleed, but there are some other things we can talk about. So albumin less than three, an INR greater than 1.5, a GCS that's reduced, and a systolic BP less than 90, and then obviously age more than 65. So this is your stock standard approach for a variceal bleed assessment. Um, obviously, this would not be relevant for this particular case, since this person seems to have had a peptic ulcer bleed. But again, really, really important to know. And the AIM-65 is an excellent tool for variceal bleed severity scoring. Immediate resuscitation management. Again, this person has lost a lot of blood. Before we even talk about what the pathology might be, you want to make sure that they're hemodynamically stable. This indicates your ABCs of doctor's ABC and resuscitate them. So ensure adequate oxygenation, two large IV cannulas, give them IV crystalloids. If they have had significant enough bleeding, give them blood. In terms of bloods, you want to do an FPE, UEC, LFT, coags, group and hold, as well as a match. Um, this is because it is likely that they may need blood further down the tract. So we need to know that and monitor them very closely. So keep an eye on them. Regular vital signs are really vital. Um, and then lastly, medications. So consider a PPI. And very often in these cases, we just give them IV. Um, sorry, I think that should say oral BD versus infusion. Um, we, in most cases of acute bleeds, give them 80 milligrams of pentoprazole IV stat. So in one push, and then we give them another 80 over 10 hours in 100 ml solution. You do not know, need to know these numbers, but I've just put them on to be thorough. And then defensive management, um, scope them. Any, really put a camera anywhere if you can, if you're confused, right? So this would mean an upper GA endoscopy, enteroscopy, colonoscopy, whatever. This is usually gonna be done in a procedural setting with a gastroenterologist or an upper GI surgeon. Next, uh, and or an interventional radiologist, both are fine. And th the fact that we have um, kind of, with upper GI um, imaging, you also have the option of actually procedural stuff in the same um, kind of environment in the same procedure. So if you see a bleeding vessel, you can then manage it accordingly, right? And if you see an actively bleeding vessel, we have a few options we can do. We can first inject adrenaline around the vessel. And as you know, adrenaline is a vasoconstrictor, which would help close up the vessels, reduce the degree of bleeding. And you can, and after that, you can either burn the vessel and cauterize it, or you can put a clip around it. And often we do a bit of both. So we do a dual therapy. So one, so two of the three. Blood transfusion with acute blood loss. Again, we need to target the following hemoglobin levels, which is why doing a hemoglobin is very, very, very important. Instead of, now, as you may think, well, the normal hemoglobin for a male is about 120, right? But when we have acute blood loss, our goal isn't to get them to 120. Our goal is to stop them from dying. And for that, we aim for something very, very restrictive. Um, so we don't want to top them up very, very high because this can actually contribute to further mortality. Um, but we go for something a bit less. So we only transfuse them if their hemoglobin drops below 70, and we aim for the hemoglobin between 70 and 80. This is a safe space where obviously long-term you wouldn't like this, but in the acute setting, 70 to 80 is what we're looking for. If they have CCF or heart failure, we assume that their hemoglobin is not going to be doing a good enough job at the same, at the same level, sorry which is why we transfuse at 80 and then aim for 80 to 90. So just add 10 to that. Next, we have the management of an acute variceal bleed. Now, I don't want to go through all of this, but some things I've already covered, other things that I haven't. So I'll go through the things I haven't. I've talked about hemodynamic resus. I've talked about airway protection. In terms of pharmacological therapy, I talked about vasoactive medications like adrenaline that can be injected. But in variceal bleeds, we often go for something that's going to be a bit more aggressive in, the, in its form. 
So we use agents like terlipressin or acrylotide. And these do two things. Um, so not only do they cause vasoconstriction, but they also reduce the degree of portal hypertension, if there is any. And as you know, portal hypertension is what leads to these varicel bleeds. So therefore, by reducing the pressure in the portal system, you also reduce the blood flow to this varicel. With antibiotics, we also worry about, obviously with an open bleed in the gut, a lot of stuff can go into that. So we want to give them antibiotics. And usually we go for something that's quite aggressive, either IV kept triaxone or a medication like Piptas, which is composed of two antibiotics, piprocycline and tazobactam. Then you have endoscopic therapy, which is when we go down with the scope and can either ligate the varicea or band the varicea using kind of a rubber band, literally, to stop it from bleeding. And then lastly, we have salvage therapy and can do something called a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt uh, called the TIPS procedure, and that's often used for circumventing portal hypertension. But this is all very, very in-depth. I would recommend just having a read through this and understanding broad principles. I think points one and two are things that you would in instinctively get to. Using vasoactive medications, especially knowing that they reduce portal pressures is important. And then the antibiotics. And then the gold standard therapy, as you know, is going to be either ligating the varicea or banding it. I think those three things are important to know. If you don't know about TIPS procedures, you'll be more than fine. Don't worry about that. Okay, so now we have case two. Jeremy is a 57-year-old man who's presented with two days of blood in stools. Take a history. Now, just based on this, what are you going to want to ask this man? This is, again, what I have mentioned. A good summary of GI bleeding. So start with the WQQA. All the things that I mentioned earlier, ask all those questions, as well as this. So let's ask those questions. So general overview. He's gone on for two days. He's never had this before. He describes it as streaks of blood in otherwise normal stool. And this makes me think lower GI bleed. Because had it been upper GI bleed, I would expect it to be more digested, more Molina looking blood. Although can't really rule it out, but definitely pointing towards a lower GI pathology. He's had no hematemesis, consistent with a lower GI bleed. He doesn't have any abdominal pain. Let's do a quick liver screen. He doesn't have any right upper quadrant pain, no jaundice, no ascites edema, and no cognitive changes. He also has no signs of prolonged bleeding that could indicate liver cirrhosis. So his liver seems to be working just fine. Next, let's do an anemia screen. He's been fatigued for the past five months. Oh no, this could be not good. He's had two fainting spells last week. He's not pale. He doesn't have shortness of breath or palpitations, no issues with diet, which is important. So ask if they've had any changes to their diet recently. Next, let's do a colorectal cancer screen. Because as I said, with lower GI bleeds, we worry always about cancers. He's had four kgs of weight loss over the past two months, and he's had no other change to his bowel habits. Nil abdominal pain, no masses, and no signs of metastatic spread. So what investigations would you like to order? So these are your go-to things, and then we add stuff based on what we suspect. So go-to things, as I mentioned always, for upper GI bleeds, FBE, LFT, UEC, coags, do those. We do a CEA because we suspect a colorectal cancer. A colonoscopy is going to be our gold standard choice of um, imaging. We can also do a CT chest abdo pelvis to look for A, a mass, and B, to look for any metastatic spread. And finally, also a PET scan. Right? Let's go to case three. We have Mrs. B. So that patient had colorectal cancer, just if, if I wasn't clear enough with that. Now we have case number three. Mrs. B, a 70-year-old who presents with hematemesis. Now, this is going to be similar to... Okay, okay. let's just keep going through this. You, you can't get enough of these kind of things, is all I'll, is all I'll say. So, she's an old lady, arrives to the ED, uh, she's vomited earlier, and the vomit had blood, and you're now going to work through this case to get to a diagnosis and a management plan. So, she says, well, I'd not been feeling well that afternoon, Watching TV, felt sick, went to the bathroom, threw up. And what she saw was just blood. She's terrified. She yelled for her son. And then they 
she felt even dizzier, almost fainted. Her son called the ambulance. Now, what questions would you ask to for your diagnosis? Well, she mentioned pain. Um, so ask about that. So if you ask about pain, where is the pain specifically? So this is, again, going back to your WWQQA. Going back to, if you just go a few slides. Uh, okay, this is harder than I thought it would be. Going back to this framework. So this page, I want to ask everything on this page. Uh, so annoying. Okay. Okay. So she says that she has pain on her tummy and points to the epigastrum. When you asked about the pain, you say, she says it's been going on and off for a few months. Pain is usually a dull ache, but sometimes sharp. Doesn't go anywhere. And she does feel a bit nauseous when that happens. The bleeding has never happened before, which is important to ask. And the pain is better when she eats food. Aha, what, what could this be, I wonder? And in terms of severity, she says it's a five out of 10. What does the blood look like? Well, it's fresh red blood. And she's never had anything like this. She's had no changes to her stool. And um, when you ask her, do you have any medical conditions, any stomach ulcers or liver problems? Just ask them straight up. Have you had ulcers in your stomach? She says, no, nothing really, except for this back pain that I've had for ages. I don't know if I have anything else. I haven't seen the doctor for 10 years, which is very is what I've heard so many times with GPs. Do you drink alcohol or smoke? If so, how often? No, I don't drink. No regular medications, just painkillers. And what kind of pain meds? Always ask. Well, I've been taking ibuprofen for my back pain for the last three years. I never miss a dose. How does she look? She looks very pale and she has some blood around her mouth. Was she conscious when she arrived? Well, no, not initially. And she only responded, she didn't respond for the first 10 to 20 seconds. When she regained consciousness, was she oriented or um, was she confused? And this is important because one of the things we worry about is reduced GCS with issues of the liver, right? We worry about an encephalopathy. But she wasn't confused. She was oriented. She was just upset and worried. What did the blood look like? Was it bright red or dark? How much blood? So there's blood, la, 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 la. There was blood around her mouth. It was red. Um, the sun says that there was blood all over the floor, more on the toilet, at least one to two cups worth. So how would you assess her? Again, A, B, C, D, E approach. Airway is patent. In terms of breathing, normal chest expansion, clear chest, respirate 10, and SpO2 of 92, which is slightly low. Circulation. Mrs. Mrs. Brown feels pale and feels cold and clammy, looks pale. Her cap refills three seconds, slightly on the upper side. Heart rate is 100, so she's borderline tacky. Blood pressure is 100 over 70, going to a uh, hypo. Well, I can't say going to because we don't know a trend, but the ECG shows, shows a sinus tachycardia as well. All these features make me think that she has had some vascular issue or something to do with her hemodynamic status, but it hasn't been bad enough to cause kind of anything disastrous just yet. Um, apart from that, we look at her pupils. She's alert, she's awake, all that's fine. Um, when we then look at her exposure, so physically looking at her, you see no stigmata of chronic liver disease. She has mild epigastric tenderness, but no guarding or no rebound tenderness, which is good. On rectal examination, um, this ideally should be carried out during the E part, the exposure, to identify melina or hematochesia. Um, but you don't see any of that. You just see some soft brown stools. Now, what are your differentials? Now, these are your differentials for an upper GI bleed, peptic or duodenal ulcer, which can be secondary to H. pylori or drugs such as NSAIDs, esophageal erosions, malary wise tears, bleeding varices, huge one, and then malignancies of the esophagus and the stomach. Also, fun fact, well, not fun, but when we talk about gastric and duodenal ulcers, gastric ulcers are typically because of NSAIDs and duodenal ulcers are mostly because of H. pylori. And I've talked about this in our lecture on peptic ulcer disease, but in case you haven't watched that, that's just an important tidbit to know. So investigations, what would you like to do? Urine dipstick, PR exam, urea breath test for H. pylori if we suspect it. Bloods, FBE, I want to know her hemoglobin. UECs, I want to know urea and kidney function. LFTs, does she have any liver issues? CRPs, is there an infection and coags? Again, looking at that, looking at that INR. 
Is she at risk for further bleeding? Is there any indication of liver damage? And with imaging, endoscopy, which is going to be a gastroscopy for her, and a chest x-ray, looking for a pneumoperitoneum with that perforation. Her bloods come back. Her HP is slightly low, not too bad. Her urea is elevated. Again, we are not surprised. Otherwise, remarkable. Coags are normal. You then do an endoscopy. On the endoscopy, there is a visible clot, a little, <laughs> visible clot on the lesser curvature of the stomach, and that was mechanically clipped with, uh, so mechanically clipped and also injected with adrenaline. Remember, going for that dual therapy. Uh, some other methods you can use to stop bleeding are thermal coagulation um, or fibrin therapy. And much to everyone's relief, Mrs. Brown is all good and well and recovers from this acute episode over the next couple of days. Now, question for you, should you give this person blood? And the answer is no, you shouldn't, because as we discussed, although her hemoglobin is slightly low, we do not transfuse blood unless their hemoglobin drops to 70 or below. She doesn't have congestive cardiac failure, so the threshold would be 70. And anything less than 70, yes, give her blood. Anything more, don't. Cool. What do we do next? Now, um, does she stay? Does she go? Um, and for that, we can use a score called the Blatchford score. Now, this is not a score I want you to remember. This is not going to come up on your exams. But again, just to be thorough, I've put this in. And I keep realizing I keep putting things to be thorough. And this is going to confuse you. Please don't get overwhelmed. It's not important. Just skip this slide, actually. Uh, it's, it's a risk stratification screening score due to upper GI bleeds. So um, a score of six or more is associated with a 50% risk of needing an intervention soon after the bleed, right? Um, and since Mrs. Brown shows uh, scores a score of seven based on this, and you do not need to, mem please don't memorize this score. Um, the patient, the score would recommend that she would benefit the most from hospital-based management. Some important things that I want to talk about. So this comes up time and time again. I don't think it's adequately discussed, but important to know. Fecal occult blood testing, which is the test you do for colorectal cancer done above the age of 50, is a screening test. It is only to be done if a patient is completely asymptomatic. It is only to be done if you have no indications of GI bleeding, which means if the patient has any symptoms, including change in bowel habits, abdominal pain, discomfort, iron deficiency, anemia, do not do an FOBT if you're worried about cancer. Likewise, if the patient has melina, has hematemesis, has hematochesia, do not do an FOBT because it's not going to change anything because we know the patient has, patient has blood in their stool, right? Next, the CEA, as we talked about earlier, is a good marker for colorectal cancer, but is not used for purposes of diagnosing it. Unlike other cancers like ovarian cancer, where CA 125 is actually used, which is a, again a cancer marker, CEA, so with ovarian cancer, we use CA 125 as a diagnostic tool. With CEA and colorectal, we don't. What we use it for is when we first treat them, we measure their CEA and then we monitor how that's progressing over time. If we, if we notice a sharp rise in CEA, we worry about a recurrence. You can also get nosebleeds that present with melina. So please distinguish upper GI bleeds from respiratory causes of bleeding. You can have bleeding with diverticulosis and diverticu so diverticulosis and diverticulitis are similar but slightly confusing. So diverticulosis is where you have the diverticulum and you have a friable membrane and that can often bleed. That is diverticulosis. It's typically presenting with asymptomatic bleeding. Right, but diverticulitis often that diverticulum is impacted with stool and is infected, but it doesn't bleed because that stool is blocking the blood from coming out. So you have left iliac fossa pain, you can have infective signs, but you don't typically have bleeding with diverticulitis while you do with diverticulosis. I've talked about this again in our lecture on diverticular disease, but I thought I'd just mention this again. Angiodysplasia is a big condition that slowly becoming relatively common for Monash exams. It's one that's on your matrix, although not very highly rated, but I take the next two minutes to talk about angiodysplasia. So it's a very common condition. 
What is angiodysplasia? So angio meaning vessel, dysplasia meaning poorly formed. So it is a vascular abnormality where you have a clump of blood vessels that are abnormal. Because they are abnormal, these vessels are at a high risk of bleeding, and they would bleed into the gastro, into the intestinal lumen. Because these can be anywhere from the these these angiodysplastic angiodysplastic lesions can be anywhere from the duodenum to the ileum. It can present with either upper GI bleeding or lower GI bleeding, which is important to know. Also important to know, because this typically presents between the duodenum and the ileum, it is not going to be picked up in most cases by a gastroscopy or a colonoscopy. Why? Well, because the gastroscopy just looks at the stomach and the first part of the duodenum, and the colonoscopy looks at the entire large bowel and the, first, and the last part of the ileum. Anything between those two is not going to be picked up on colonoscopy or gastroscopy. And therefore, the imaging of choice is a CT, angio uh, CT angiography with contrast. Because this is a vascular abnormality, if we inject contrast in those vessels, just in the vessels, and obviously that would go to the abnormal vessels as well, you would see this light up on a CT scan. And therefore, the CT angiography is the um, investigation of choice for this case. This came up on our exams as a question. I suspect it did. Um, this, the prompt was that a man is presenting with melina for the past few weeks, otherwise completely well, no other symptoms. You do a colonoscopy, you can't find anything. You do a gastroscopy, you can't find anything. What's the next best diagnostic test? That run next best diagnostic. Uh, no, so, and the answer was a CT angiography, because the thing we were suspecting was angiodysplasia. And that's the end of our lecture on approaching GI bleeding. I hope that was helpful. I'm sorry if that went on for a bit too long. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch. And as always, please look after yourself and please look after your loved ones.